But Havlicek steals it. Havlicek stole the ball. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. Swing! This is gonna be a home run! Unbelievable! I don't believe what I just saw! Hello, I'm Chris Fowler, and welcome to Sports Century. Latrell Sprewell doesn't play basketball, he attacks it. His drives are a chaotic blur of speed and muscle, and when his jump shots are falling, he's a team unto himself. But an anti-authoritarian temper that he has nurtured since childhood burned a hole in his reputation. In December of 1997, the flames of Sprewell's discontent with his coach erupted across the NBA horizon. When Carlissimo was hired in the summer of 97, the Warriors' slogan was no more Mr. Nice Guys. And they had billboards around the Bay Area with Carlissimo and the assistant coaching staff uh, wearing dark sunglasses. Well, the objective was you had a coach previously that uh, may have been more laid back. Now there was somebody that's going to come in a little different than that. PJ was pretty much a yeller. He, um, he got in your face and let you know when something was wrong. He was like a yapping dog. And uh, he needed a leash and a muzzle. And he was bothering everybody. I think everybody realized, so oh, this is just not going to work. I mean, they may have gone way too far in the other direction. These guys can't possibly coexist. You cannot have a guy like Sprewell playing for a coach like Carlissimo. If P.J. Carlissimo was increasingly frustrated by the Warriors' lack of response to his aggressive coaching style, his scoring star, Latrell Sprewell, had already drawn public criticism for an off-the-court incident involving his four-year-old daughter three years earlier in 1994. He had a pet pit bull, and it attacked his daughter, bit off most of her ears. She had to have just enormous amounts of surgery, and people quite naturally questioned him and say, well, you're going to get rid of that dog. And he said at the time that he wasn't going to put the dog down. And when he said that, that raised a lot of eyebrows around Bay Area. People really got this feeling of him as a sort of cold-hearted monster as a result of that episode. On the court, Sprewell's confrontational behavior resulted in two fights with bigger teammates during practice. First with Byron Houston in 1993, and then with Jerome Kersey two years later. It became apparent to Sprewell's teammates that he wanted to get to Jerome Kersey. And Sprewell went back and got, you know, the now famous two by four because he wanted to get at Jerome Kersey. Clearly, you have a guy who played with a tremendous amount of passion, who had a tremendous temper that when he felt someone was attacking him or his manhood was being challenged, he was going to come after you. In the fall of 1997, tension between Carlesimo and Sprewell increased. After being reprimanded for laughing in the huddle during a blowout loss, the player responded by calling his coach a joke. On November 28th, the three-time All-Star was fined after missing a team flight. There were things that we were doing on the court that I felt like we should do differently. And then you know, I'll tell PJ, and he just wouldn't change. And, and it's not that we were losing. We were losing by like 15 to 20 points every night. Spray and myself, we would get together and talk every night and say, you know, how come PJ's not listening to us? And that was an ongoing problem, just probably from day one in training camp. You could see that it was escalating, getting more and more to the point where they just really, I think, just really didn't enjoy being around each other. I could count at least three or four times where we were going at each other in practice. You know, he'd say stuff to me, I'd say stuff back. And for me, this is all new because I've never had that with a coach. So to have this uh, happening on a daily basis was definitely frustrating. There were incidents when uh, PJ would take Latrell out of a game where he'd go down and sit on the end of the bench and you could see Latrell mocking him and talking to other teammates about, you know, what a joke he thought this guy was. If he respect you, he'd get along with you. He didn't respect Carlissimo. During practice on December 1st, 1997, Carlissimo sparked the emotional kindling that had been built for weeks inside his top player. 
Carlissimo was down at the far end of the court and he wasn't happy with how hard Spreewell was going through this drill and he, he said something to Spreewell. He was telling me he wasn't throwing passes hard enough, so it's embarrassing when a coach does that to you. At that point, Carlissimo began to walk the length of the court to approach Spreewell and Spreewell basically told Carlissimo, you know, to get away from him. It was just a build up of anger and frustration and just having it all bottled up and, and not being able to express myself and at that point it just came to a hit. We just heard a ball slam and the next thing you know Spreewell has PJ around his neck. Eventually pulled away by his teammates Spreewell left the court. 20 minutes later he returned and launched a second attack on Carlesimo. Then the next thing you know he leaves and he comes back and we're all gathered around and Spree's just peed off and, and, and saying, you know, get me out of here, trade me, and, and then he left. No one ever wrote how Bimbo wanted to come in there and talk to me. They prevented him from coming in there and talking to me. If they had let him do that, then it wouldn't have even been a little second time. The fact that he would leave, think about it, and then come back and do it again, I think that kind of cinched the public relations deal that whatever happened there, P.J. Carlesimo was going to be the victim. And one of the things that I was kind of disappointed in is that that happened in a practice setting and nobody really had to know anything about it. When the doors opened at the uh, practice facility in Oakland, with Charles Spreewell is conspicuously absent. P.J. gathered the writers around to uh, give them his usual daily post-practice uh, comments, except that he had huge marks <laughs> right along the sides of his neck like this. I made a, a joking comment with, you know, did you cut yourself shaving today? Did you have a bad razor? And he looked at me and he said, no comment. Are we dealing with anger management and people skills and, and interaction of people? Yeah. Was there surprise on everybody's part? When things happen like that, yes, because that's way the heck out of the norm in our business. We had an incident today, multiple incidents today in our practice, which uh, involved the trail Spreewell. There were words exchanged back and forth and uh, asked uh, Spree to leave practice, and uh, he didn't, and the words kind of escalated to uh, some physical contact. It's a very volatile emotional game, but you know, you can never lose your composure. I mean, as a coach, you can never put your hands on a player. As a player, you can never put your hands on a coach. What Latrell Spreewell did to P.J. Carlissimo was a crime in any setting. That is an assault. That is a battery. When you come back the second time, it's an aggravated battery. There's obvious intent to harm the coach. For his double assault, Spreewell paid twice. First, the remaining $23.7 million in his contract with the Warriors was terminated. Then, NBA Commissioner David Stern leveled him with the longest non-drug-related suspension in history, one year without pay. I think because there had never been anything exactly like this uh, that had happened before, that the commissioner had, uh, you know, was really breaking new ground as to you know, what the penalty would be. Michael Jordan was less than a few months from retiring from the game and there was this great concern in the NBA who's going to carry the torch and David Stern made sure it wasn't going to be Latrell Sprewell. That was one of his roughest times. You watch some of the Golden State games you could see it in him though you could see that wow I got treated unfairly you can see it just in his face like you know I shouldn't I, I should still be playing right now you know it was just it wasn't my fault. It was the most difficult thing that I've had to deal with in my life. And I don't really think a lot of people would have held up under that much pressure. I understand that there are many fans that feel that I let them down. I want to say to them, I'm sorry. Again, I want to apologize to my teammates because I have made a lot of friends here and the Bay Area has been great to me. However much he regretted his actions, Spreewell filed a grievance through the Players Union, hiring legal gun Johnny Cochran as his consultant. As he pressed his case against Golden State, a human face began to emerge from behind the national bad boy image. It took the form of a troubled child in Milwaukee. Latrell grew up in a place where there wasn't a lot of money. His father and mother had these physical confrontations where, you know, the police had to be called. With his father ransacking the house, he's turning over chairs, he's breaking mirrors, he's putting his fist through who knows what. 
takes the car and then loads it with all of her possessions and drives off. Such is the state of their marriage that she decides to press charges and that results in one of his several jail terms. My mother and father didn't get along that well. It was kind of rough for us at times. We came from somewhere that was really kind of torn up. His parents split up when he was a young boy. An abusive father was pretty much the cause of the split. The man that Latrell Sprewell's mother hooked up with after the divorce was physically abusive. Now enters a new man in Latrell's world, her mother's boyfriend. And what ensued were, by Latrell's account, some beatings and a point in his life where he learned to distrust strangers and distrust strange men. I wasn't happy with my mom's boyfriend at the time, you know, so I thought it would be better for me to just go live with my dad. Before he would join his father, the seven-year-old Sprewell lived with his grandparents in Flint, Michigan. After moving in with his father, Latoska Fields, six years later, Latrell's life was disrupted again. Fields, a small-time marijuana dealer, was sentenced to two years for illegal possession of a sawed-off shotgun. Seeing family members, you know, in and out of jail was something that, unfortunately, that I had to deal with as a, as a child and coming up. But when it's one of your parents, it is tougher. We even visited our father when he was locked up. You know, the emotions came out. We was definitely hurt by the time that he had to spend in there. That was time lost from us that we couldn't be with him. It really hurt to see his father caged like an animal. He thinks he held in way too much over the years, that there was some hostility and some anger unresolved that may have led him to have the incident with P.J. Carlissimo. I think he held a lot of stuff in that he wanted to get out. And I think that was a lot of him holding a lot of frustrations in about a lot of things that happened in the family. Before his junior year, Sprewell returned to Milwaukee to live with his mother, who had since separated from the man who had abused her son. Although he had not played organized basketball for his first three years of high school, as a senior, Sprewell's raw talent was recognized by the new Washington high coach told the assistant coach and said, um, there's a kid that's never played that could be all state this year. And of course, he said, no way. When he was younger, we didn't really actually have a basketball court. We made a court and like an alley back home. And I could tell that he had the skills in him already because I was a lot bigger than him. And he could do things and get around me and score and everything. Despite averaging 28 points, Sprewell was not offered a college scholarship. After refining his game at Three Rivers Junior College in Missouri, Sprewell transferred to Alabama in 1990 and made all Southeastern Conference as a senior. He was an extraordinary athlete and a very good defender. And you could, you could see potential in him. Was it the kind of potential you wanted to take a risk on with a first round pick? With the 24th pick in the 1992 NBA draft, the Golden State Warriors select Latrell Sprewell from the University of Alabama. Is this a joke? There is no Latrell Sprewell. We couldn't figure out who he was. He comes into camp, he's Superman. This is like striking gold. I think you saw Latrell Sprewell when he first made the All-Star team and he got a chance to match up with Jordan and you saw what a great player he was. I remember talking to Michael later and you know, he'd say to him, well, who are the toughest guys you ever had to play against? And he used to say, well now, Sprewell guards me as well as anybody. He was lightning quick. Coach used to put him in the game and says, just shut him down. Don't let him catch the ball. Don't let him touch the ball. And Spree was in people's jocks. The thing that probably makes Spree uh, most effective is his energy. Oh, he's a three-dimensional player. You know, he's a guy who can break you down. He can shoot the jump shot. You know, he can make passes. He's just real smooth and sleek with this game. For six seasons, Sprewell lit up the league, averaging 20 points and playing hard-nosed defense. But after his attack on P.J. Carlissimo, his future in the NBA was uncertain. I think everyone thought, well, this is going to be the end of Charles Sprewell's career because no one could imagine anything worse happening to a player than attacking a coach and getting kicked out of the league. People say, I'm America's worst nightmare. I say, I'm the American dream. He was able to tap into this anti-authority, almost counterculture through his and one commercials. So what had been a scary 
wild man who wouldn't obey his coach was also all of a sudden had turned himself into an individualist who was interesting. If there's any city that gives you a second chance, that's New York. And they don't give you it because they just happen to be uh, charitable. If you perform for their team, then you're gold and all is forgotten. After Latrell Sprewell's suspension, which had been reduced through arbitration to 68 games, he met with Nick's management in January of 1999. They drilled me with questions, but I, I felt like when they left, they had a good sense of uh, what type of person I was. The thing I was most impressed about with Latrell during that meeting was that he didn't try to make excuses and or alibi. He said he was wrong for the incident with PJ, and he was ready to move forward and resume his career. After being traded to the Knicks for John Starks and two other players, Sprewell still had to prove his value to a skeptical public. I think he was still a plague. I think people didn't want to touch him. I think the feeling was, oh boy, when is he going to snap? When is he going to do something crazy? When he came to New York, he was this guy that was supposed to be a bad guy, but came in with a lot of fanfare, you know, and the crowd took to him because of his energy and the way how he played. Spree saw the machinery at work, and he saw what a hit he took not saying anything and being quiet, and how that put everybody on PJ's side in that incident and left him as this silent bad guy. He's always in the locker room to talk to the press. He is always there to explain how things went bad. He's always there to take the heat when he screws up. Uh, he did not come with the best possible resume, but he won everybody over to the point he became the most popular Nick by far, and uh, I would say one of the most popular athletes in New York City. I always said that the, the real test of the trail would be, when will the suburban white family decide to let their son wear the number eight jersey? By the middle of that first season in New York, all the kids you know, were wearing the Spiro jerseys. Yeah, as far as basketball goes, he really presents what you want. You know, in the court, he's all out war. But off the court, he's intelligent, articulate, into intellectual pursuits, kind of like chess and computers. So he, it's a very interesting dichotomy there. A lot of people just look at him with his cornrows and they say, oh, he's a thug, or he's this or he's that. But he's very intelligent. I mean, he's fixed my car. He's a mechanic. If you've been in his house in Oakland, I mean, he has a full-on auto body shop in there. He takes stereo equipment VCRs apart and then puts them back together. You know, the guy was a social work major in college, which a lot of people don't realize. There's a Latrell Sprewell outside of basketball. He just chooses not to let people know that. A few years ago, at a charity, I purchased the Knicks ball boy, ball girl for a day for my daughter. And Sprewell was the, the Nick assigned to the, the ball kid of the day. The way he treated my daughter made me think that perhaps all those bad things that Spree used to do were an act and that this was the genuine Spree. Playing under control as the Knicks' sixth man, Sprewell averaged 16 points as New York reached the 1999 NBA Finals. Although the overachievers lost to the Spurs in five games, Sprewell had gotten what he always craved, respect. That was, I guess, his coming out party. He's been waiting since he got here to shine, and he finally got his, his opportunity, and he took full advantage of it. Here's Sprewell! Yeah! Whoa! Slam it down with a tomahawk! Sprewell is like lightning. And he did it with his energy and his skill and his personality. And the team loved him. Marcus Camby and those guys were saying, he's our leader. Imagine that. Now he's their leader. Unbelievable. Before a game on Christmas Day 2001, away from the cameras, Latrell Sprewell shook hands with P.J. Carlissimo. Four years earlier, that same hand had been around his former coach's throat. It took me a while to even be able to say anything to P.J. I mean, honestly, after everything that I had been through and everything that I had to go through myself and my family, it was, uh, it was difficult. If one nasty chapter in his career had ended, Sprewell was beginning another. After Jeff Van Gundy resigned as coach earlier that December, Sprewell's relationship with Nick's management deteriorated. Jeff was a guy who 
believe that you do treat your star players like star players and you don't have to treat them all the same. And that's sort of how he'd been treated the last, you know, the first couple of years he was here. And the, the rules changed on him. The trial spree well will say what he wants, will play the way he wants, will do what he wants, because that's who he is. It's not a bad thing, uh, as long as the Knicks are winning. But when that team falls apart and he starts pointing fingers, then all of a sudden he's not the best guy in the world again. He carried the squad on his back. And what did the Knicks do right after that? They signed Allen Houston to a $99 million contract. And I think that's where it all went wrong. I, I mean, for Latrell, where he was like, you know what? Come on now. I have proven on this court that I'm your $100 million man. When it comes to crunch time, I'm your fourth quarter. That's what he was like, you know what? I'm done. When Sprewell missed a pregame shoot-around in April of 2002, Knicks chairman James Dolan suspended him for one game. That fall, Sprewell arrived at training camp with a broken hand. Claiming he wasn't aware of the fracture, he said he had hurt it two weeks earlier on his yacht. Dolan fined him $250,000 and barred him from the team until the injury healed. If I had known it was broken, I mean, I would have gotten this at least gotten the cast put on it. You can find me, bro. Why keep me away from the team? That's, that's really not, I didn't feel like that that was necessary. I didn't feel like that that really helped the team. He's also a guy that won't be bullied, though. And I think that's what you see reflecting in this sort of spat between Knicks management and Latrell Sprewell. Why does this stuff always happen to the same guy? You have to ask a question. I, I, it can't be total coincidence that these things all seem to happen to Latrell Sprewell. After more than a year on the trading block, Sprewell was dealt to Minnesota in July of 2003. With five seasons in New York under his belt, the 33-year-old swingman with the double-edged reputation took his game to the Midwest. I am conscious and I do care about my image, but I don't really care about negative things that I hear because I know I can't change everyone and I have a better understanding of how things work and why it is what it is now and why it was what it was five years ago. So, you know, I'm just trying to do everything I can to make sure that, uh, you know, it, it's where I want it to be. In their subconscious, when they see him, when they, when you hear the name the trust be well, I'm sure people are gonna instantly think of that answer that that's something that you can't get around like a scar that's there. The thing is, that, that, that sucks the most is, Sprewell, I think, is a good kid who's a, a terrific player. And he's going to be scarred for that forever. What he's done so far is he's enabled people to say it's not going to be the only thing they remember about Latrell Sprewell, and I think ultimately that's about the most he can hope for. He's the classic enigma. I don't think anyone has a handle on who Latrell Sprewell is other than Latrell Sprewell. I think he's, you know, has a holographic quality that depending on who's looking at him, they may see something different. When he was bad, he was very, very bad, and Latrell Sprewell paid the price. But when he was good, he was rewarded. Even when his lawsuit to regain the $6.4 million he lost when he was suspended without pay in 1997-98 was still pending, Commissioner David Stern allowed him to appear in the NBA's commercials during 2000. In a league where image is emphasized, Sprewell has walked a crooked path between shadow and light. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.